Some of my favourite things to do on this channel is to look at the Flat Earth documentaries. We originally looked at the imaginatively titled Level back in 2021, totally debunking it across three videos. Then a year later in 2022, we looked at the next level, again leaving it in tatters. And you'll be delighted to hear that a third documentary has been made. One in which they think is a game changer, and it's called Level With Me. Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Flat Earth Friday with me, Simon Dan. Yes, I am back from my break. Thank you very much for joining me. Right, back to today's video, which as I said, is the first part of a mini series looking at the new Flat Earth documentary, Level With Me. Today we're gonna to take a look at the first 10 minutes or so, uh, so let's get on with it. Okay, level with me here. There's this idea that we live on a ball and it's spinning traveling through space at unfathomable speeds, yet you can't measure it, you can't repeat it or observe it. At this point, it becomes a religion. What are you holding on to? Do you care what other people think? Are you just worried what your friends and family are gonna say? Is it your satellites? Is it your aliens? There are no satellites in the vacuum of space. Satellites are satellites. Well, we're off to a flyer, aren't we? Satelloons? I'm assuming he means that all satellites are just balloon satellites suspended above what he believes is a plane. Well, as of the time of filming, using the website Orbiting Now, we can see that there are currently 7,915 objects orbiting Earth as we speak. Now, most of those are in low Earth orbit, but it is an orbit all the same. Additionally, I don't think a weather balloon can propel an object 27,000 miles an hour. Do you? You're aliens. Let's say you're, you're an outer space alien fanatic. What if I told you you can have your aliens too? That, that they come from outer space, not upper space, but outer space. Now, this is Flat Earth Millionaire, who I once won $200,000 from in a video challenge. Still waiting for that, by the way. And he is making the classic misunderstanding here that space is up because he believes he lives on a giant space pizza. Now it is up, of course, from a gravitational perspective, uh, which means it's also outer because everything below our feet downwards is inner towards the inside of our planet. They are extraterrestrials. Terrestrial meaning terrain, meaning land. So what is it? What's stopping you? You've never seen curvature with your own eyes. You never felt the earth spinning. You never, you've never been able to observe and measure these claims. So at this point it becomes a religion. Do you want to become free? What if there's thousands upon thousands of other continents? What if there is an actual creator? This place was designed for a purpose. This isn't an accident. Yes, because designing a world with creatures that 99% of the time can or want to kill you is a great idea. If this world truly had a designer, then why make things hard to get? Why make the ocean non-drinkable? Why make it intentionally difficult to extract and process minerals from the Earth's surface? You get my point. Would your life change? We're all supposed to live in abundance. We're all supposed to be here for a purpose and learn and love and live. Got no problem with that whatsoever. It makes me wonder why these people care so much about the shape of the Earth if that truly is their attitude. Being on a ball from an accident of a big bang Evolved from monkeys. Monkey-like ancestors, actually. That's no way to live. That's no way to perceive life. You're an accident. You have no purpose. What's stopping you? Being an accident doesn't mean you can't have a purpose. Coming into existence by chance doesn't mean you can't have a purpose. Now that is a very dogmatic and narrow-minded way to think, which is a way of thinking more likened to religion than knowing that the Earth is a globe. Look out here. There's no curvature. Well, not in your backyard, no. 120,000 feet, 30,000 feet, it's nowhere to be seen. Where's the curve? It's time to pay attention. It's time to wake up. It's time to become free. Now, with all due respect, you lot have been saying this for almost 10 years. 10 years, guys. No one is really interested in waking up to the reality that you're selling. You're done, mate. 
it's over. Seven, six. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and lift off. Lift off of the 25th space shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. On January 28, 1986, CNN watched the Challenger launch live on the air with its viewers. Oh my days! Change the record. Come up with something new. They and the other media outlets told you that the astronauts died in the explosion. But as always, there is an agenda behind every mainstream headline. And what agenda exactly would you have regarding the death of seven astronauts? This morning, it looked as though they were not going to be able to get off. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity 2,900 feet per second. Altitude 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance 7 nautical miles. Looks like a couple of the uh, solid rocket boosters uh, blew away from the side of the shuttle in an explosion. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Today is a day for mourning and remembering. Nancy and I are pained to the core by the tragedy of the shuttle Challenger. We know we share this pain with all of the people of our country. This is truly a national loss. And it was a terrible accident, which upon investigation looks like it could have been avoided. Richard Feynman himself was key in figuring out what went wrong. Now he discovered that an O-ring seal on one of the solid rocket boosters failed because of the particular cold weather that day. Now watch this. Oh, I took the stuff that I got out of your seal and I put it in ice water. And I discovered that when you put some pressure on it, for a while and then undo it, it maintains, it doesn't stretch back, it stays the same dimension. In other words, for a few seconds at least, and more seconds than that, there's no resilience in this particular material when it's at a temperature of 32 degrees. I believe that has some significance for our problem. Genius. The seven NASA astronauts supposedly killed in the 1986 Challenger disaster did not die in the explosion and are quietly living out their lives in the US, with many of them hiding in plain sight, using their same names and working at high levels in the same fields they worked in before the disaster. Yes, because if you were part of a government cover-up that involved you living a secret life because you were supposed to be dead, you'd absolutely use the same name and work in the same field, wouldn't you? Now this is what makes me laugh about flat earthers. Not once when this theory started circling did one flat earther say, well that's a bit rubbish isn't it, we'd absolutely change your name. According to explosive evidence uncovered by investigators. We've located six out of seven of them. Ah, by investigators you of course mean David Weiss of the channel DITRH. The man who has been debunked more times than I can remember. In the world of deception, it's really easy to say this person is that person, and there's a lot of that going on, um, muddying the waters. But six out of seven have identical names. They work for universities, most of them. There were no people in the Challenger. That was a hoax. That's been proven conclusively by researchers and reporters, investigators, who have found that those supposed people that were in the Challenger are still alive today. Oh, are they, Santos? This man here is David Weiss Halavini. Hmm, looks strikingly like our own David Weiss, but with a beard. Something you aren't telling us, David. This man is Newcastle Knights player Mark Sargent. Been playing a bit of rugby when you were younger, Mark. My point is, it's not hard to find people that have the same name that look a bit similar. We remember Dick Scobie, the commander who spoke the last words we heard from the Space Shuttle Challenger. We remember Michael Smith. We remember Judith Resnick. We remember Krista McAuliffe. We remember Alison Onizuka. We remember Ronald McNair. Now these are all fully explainable as you will see. People still think the Challenger exploded with these astronauts, it was a horrible thing, never happened. Yes, the rocket exploded. There was no one on board. So imagine that you're at the launch of the Challenger. This is a historic moment and it blows up in midair. Whether you are personally related to somebody on there, or don't know anybody, you're gonna be a mess. This is an emotional, incredible scene. And CNN was reporting and they told the cameraman, let's get a live shot of Krista's parents. And when they zoomed in on them, they were giggling, they were laughing, they were smiling. 
I don't know how you can put a smile on someone's face even if you told them the funniest joke in the world at that very moment. Just look at their face. Is that the face of somebody whose daughter just blew up in the most horrific, violent accident ever? Or is that somebody playing a role not knowing that they're on camera and thinking about the money that they may have gotten? Her parents probably didn't know what was going on at first. They're not regular viewers of NASA. They don't know exactly what's happening all the time. And as usual with Flat Earthers, if you look at the footage properly with the sound, you can see that these images were captured before NASA confirmed that there had been an explosion. You can hide somebody that's allegedly dead right in plain sight. All you have to do is move them a little farther away, give them a different job, claim that they're somebody else. But with the same name, sure David, sure. You don't even need to change their name. Well, you sort of do, don't you? If you don't want people to get suspicious. I mean, it would probably be the first job, wouldn't it? So statistically speaking, the odds that almost everyone on the Challenger have exact lookalikes with exact names still existing is kind of laughable, honestly. And I'm sure you can show us, Witsit, can't you? The maths regarding this statistical humor. No, you can't. Oh, okay. Exact doppelgangers existing in the world with the same names. And when confronted, they get very nervous and they, their stories begin to conflict and they have the same mannerisms. You know, it doesn't take a lot to put it together, honestly. The thing is, they're not exact doppelgangers. They look a bit like them at best. And by the way, confronting these people in public is an absolute disgrace. If that was me and I kept getting confronted, then I'd be annoyed. I'll tell you to do one. Let's start with former NASA astronaut Michael J. Smith with the same name as this retired professor from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Michael Smith. Michael Smith. I wonder how many Michael Smiths there are in America. Are you Michael Smith? Yeah. Professor at uh, university? Retired. Retire? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just stopped by because there's a this room. Are you aware of that there's a rumor on the internet? It's that, not me. That people are saying. Yeah, it's not me, obviously. I mean, anybody that looks at my background, looks where I was born, it's not me. And he's bang on. Michael J. Smith of the Challenger mission was born in 1945 in Beaufort, North Carolina. He went on to become an advanced jet plane instructor in the Navy before flying in the Vietnam War and then becoming a test pilot. He joined NASA in 1980. Michael Smith, the professor, was born in Madison, Wisconsin and worked in health and safety for most of his life. Now this is a photo of Michael Smith, the professor, in 1990, just over three and a half years after the Challenger disaster. You really expect us to believe that these are the same people? I mean, it's interesting that the uh, Michael J. Smith that was the astronaut looks something like me when we mm -hmm. were younger, but really not if you really look at facial recognition. You've never been a pilot, never been in the military? Been nothing, nothing like that. Huh. No. Okay. Yeah. That's all and I, I don't, And I don't respond to the emails I get. I get probably an email maybe two a month. Really? That, yeah, and I got one yeah. guy that's been... Uh, really hounding me and I, I put, turned it over to the FBI. Okay. Yeah, you just sure look a lot. It's the same I know, name. I know yeah. the facial thing, but that's that's what we looked like, what, 40 years ago? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Michael J. Smith, identical looks, uh, dimples the same, teeth the same. Uh, there's really no denying it. Are you really, David, saying that whilst these two photos are on the screen, that their teeth are the same? Look at them. University Professor Michael's two front teeth are overlapping his incisors next to them. NASA Michael's incisors are all flush with each other. The other thing to take note of is their ears. Totally, totally different. Now granted, they look a bit alike, but that is not the same person. And before he could finish the question, Michael denied it. Oh, that's not me. That's not me, you know, and laughed off. What's he gonna say? Oh, you got me? He says he gets around two emails a month about it. He's clearly annoyed about the constant questions. Not gonna happen. The driveway footage of Michael J. Smith, that's real. I mean, that, that can't be a deep fake, you know? So at some point, you gotta stop trusting uh, liars. We don't hide our space program. We don't keep secrets and cover things up. We do it all up front and in public. Next is former NASA astronaut Judith Resnick with an exact doppelganger working at Yale University. 37 years have passed and she hasn't even changed her name. Side by side, there's no denying it. 
When she's approached, she has a very odd way of not responding. Hey, uh, hey, uh, Judy. Judy, how you doing? I, I'm, I'm from the press. I just had a quick question, if you don't mind. What press? I, I'm from a you. radio station in San Bernardino. I know there's a consp is... conspiracy about the uh, space shuttle. No, I want to be polite. Um, I, 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 fr friendly, uh, just a question. So there's a lot of rumors about you being on that space shuttle. Obviously, you know, if you want to comment, we would really appreciate it. Kind of odd that Judith is in full panic mode when realizing the press is in her presence. Not odd at all. And it wasn't panic mode, it was annoyed mode, and I don't blame her. She's no stranger to being in the spotlight. She even made her way into Hollywood for a quick cameo as an American hero. Again, they do not look the same. Teeth are different, noses are different, eyebrows are different, and by the way, Judith Resnick was a professor of law at Yale, as well as working for NASA. Incredible work ethic there. This is Professor Judith in 1990, again only three and a half years later, looking nothing like NASA Judith. Dick Scobie had a company called Cows and Trees, and when you went to his website, there was an animation of a cow taking off like a rocket with a smoke stream coming out of its backside, doing a twisty curl in the air that looked remarkably just like what we saw with the Challenger. Okay, first off, it looks nothing like it. And secondly, so what? Cows and Trees is a marketing agency. Why wouldn't they have something like this on their website? I mean, this is absolutely reaching, even for you guys. And after we started making videos on that and it started going viral, that website disappeared, never to be seen again. Yeah, because you harassed them, I expect, to the point where it wasn't even worth it anymore. Sickening behavior. And nobody could have predicted back in 1986 that in 30 some odd years from then, that there would be something called the internet that would bring all this information to the tip of your fingers and you'd be able to search through pictures, Facebooks, websites, profiles, now these people are scared. They're hiding their profiles, they're deleting their websites, they're making their Facebooks private. You lot have got a big opinion of yourselves, don't you? People do all that stuff anyway, for a variety of reasons. Anazuka and McNair are always together. They're hanging out at NASA and always talking about themselves. Ellison Onizuka, if you look at clips of him back in 1986 when this happened, he actually spoke like, uh, every other word was, uh... Let me say that uh, it's really a pleasure to be back. Uh, if you look at clips of his brother, Claude, now speaking, it's the same exact thing. Every other word is, uh... But uh, Allison's dream is continued to be carried on. Uh, I think we got some... Uh, we're very fortunate that the... Uh, uh, I think uh, we're ready to go fly. Thanks for uh, being out here today. Yes, his brother was only three years younger than him. They would have had almost identical upbringings, so it's no surprise that they talk similar. His brother just so happens to be the spokesperson for the Challenger tragedy. Why aren't there any pictures of his brother back when this happened? Why didn't his brother speak at the funeral? Use your head. Oh yeah, massive surprise that an astronaut's brother is involved with his memory. Massive surprise. Former Governor Ariyoshi, who has a story about a picture that survived the Challenger disaster. Ellison Onizuka came to see me one day and he wanted a family photo. And he wanted to take it up on a Challenger and he's going to bring it back, inscribe it, and autograph it. But that Challenger accident happened and I felt very sorry to lose Ellison. But I didn't even think about the photo. I thought everything else must have been destroyed completely. About two months later, Lorna Onizuka called me and told me that they found in the water, NASA found the uh, personal preference kit of uh, Elton Onizuka. And she said, there were two things in there. One was a monk, monk's uh, prayer, and the other was his family portrait. Wow, what a shambles. This is not a photo of the Onizaka family. This is a photo of Governor Ariyoshi's family, as in the old man holding the photo in this clip. Flat Earthers doing their own research there like never before. So I told her, oh, then it must be in terrible condition because the astronauts, uh, the, uh, the big bang up and the ocean in the water for two months. She told me, no, it's in perfect condition. And she said, I'm gonna bring the picture over to you and give it to you. And then in the meantime, NASA 
got the picture and it put this together for us. And that took three minutes to research and it says a lot about the flat earther's honesty there, doesn't it? Ronald McNair conveniently has a twin brother named Carl McNair who looks exactly like him. Again, this is poor research. Carl was Ronald's older brother, not his twin. However, the age gap was less than a year, so it's not surprising that they look alike. And is at a lot of the events now, but was nowhere to be found when the explosion happened. So what does this prove? He does state that he was watching the launch on TV, but I guess you guys aren't gonna buy that. Krista McAuliffe was a fairly new teacher just three years at that school. To get her story planted, all of these people, the parents, the astronauts, everyone involved that you saw, a you know, crisis actor. Crisis actor. As he was at the Cape in the stands to see Tuesday's launch, a sight that she says still haunts her. Why didn't I leave too? But I thought, no, I want to stay and see it. And as she read Mike's invitation for the launch, Ms. Hesse said that she doesn't know if she'll be emotionally ready for a service like that in his hometown. Since I won't be able to see you all in person, let me say thanks for coming and have a great time. And I hope you see a good show. George Bush Sr. hand-selected the teacher, Krista McCullough. What are the odds that 30 years later, there is a professor at Syracuse University with the name Sharon McCullough. What are the odds? Well, apparently there's over 8,000 people in the US with the surname McAuliffe. So the odds are fairly high, aren't they? I still can't believe that I'm gonna actually be going into that shuttle. It just, it, it just really doesn't seem possible. Krista McAuliffe was asked if she had any fears about her space shuttle flight. People really feel that space travel is safe now. It, it's not that earlier feeling that, oh, it's going to blow up or something's going to happen. Right at this point, I feel that I'll be okay if I go off. Well, where's Jarvis? How come you haven't located him? And the answer is, you know, he could have died of natural causes, a heart attack, a car accident, you know, three, four, five years later, and it would never be reported. Or you couldn't find someone with the same name that looks vaguely similar. The reason they did it was a psychological operation to justify not doing manned space flights anymore and to pull on your heartstrings with an emotional cover. So if you dare question it, then you know you're immoral. And then when you look into it, you find out, of course, that you have all these people still existing in the world. So basically a uh, government version of witness protection for NASA. What? What's funny about this is that non-flat earth people with a logical brain can look at this and say, the people you think look alike don't look alike. A flat earther is actively looking for things to support their belief. You guys genuinely see what you want to see. Our nation held a vigil by our television sets. In one cruel moment, our exhilaration turned to horror. We waited and watched. They were waiting and watching. When they saw the explosion, there was confusion. Was something wrong? The principal and teachers weren't certain either. Then it got very quiet as the horror of it began to register. Besides the trauma-based mind control and putting children through that, that trauma, and also it reinforces their model. It reinforces their religion. Trauma-based mind control? What even? And how exactly does a space shuttle exploding reinforce the fact that the Earth is spherical? Because it doesn't. It reinforces the fact that space flight is hard and accidents can happen. Look, all that this terrible thing happened, we're trying to go to space, we're trying, you know, trying to explore for science, but oh, look, all those people died. But at one o'clock, school was closed. It had to close. I felt as if uh, my whole body blew up inside when I saw that. And I can just never be as shocked as I am now. And I get that. I can only imagine what it must have felt like watching that unfold with my own eyes. Seeing it with my own eyes, it really just scared me. Some astronauts blow up in a rocket. What does that do subconsciously to the average person? They don't want to go up into space. They don't want to blow up in a rocket. We'll leave that to the professionals. We'll leave that to, to NASA and our government. Yet more people are trying to be astronauts today, probably, than ever before. What does that tell you? Once they had seen the evidence on the visual screen that there would be no survivors, it suddenly became apparent to them that they were dealing with death. The government had incentivized the different public schools to play the challenger in their classroom. So they rolled their TV sets out, they had all the children sit down and get ready to watch it, and 20% of the American public watched the challenger event happen live. And within one hour, 80% of Americans had seen the challenger tragedy happen. 
So just like with 9-11, they have everyone see this traumatic event and then we're all in unison that we're traumatized. What's funny to me about all of this is the flat earthers, they just come up with reasons and then that's that. No evidence, no proof, just reasons. And when it blew up, it was a form of uh, trauma-based mind control that you know some people will never grow out of. And then the emotions kick in and you're unable to think logically about what's going on. Of course this was planned. They made every school show this event live. They wanted these kids to grow up defending this tragedy. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but if a school teacher becomes the first civilian to be selected for space flight, does it then make sense that all schools watch this space shuttle launch? Think about how many field trips come here, unfortunately. Yeah. And they go in and watch that Heroes and Legends thing and they come out thinking that yeah. this is the greatest possible hero that they could ever be. And that's just, they're actors. <laughs> and we're building them up higher than your father, police, military, all these people that are actual heroes. Right. These are actors working for a government agency, so. Next. Hello, Hi. I'm gonna get one of these signed if that's all right. Oh my, I can feel a cringy questioning coming, can't you? Please. My name is Justin. Justin? Yes. I-N? Yes, with an I-N. Where are you from, Orlando. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> You're not far. Picture, no. Not too far. No, I'm okay on a picture, but thank you. I do have a question, though. Oh, I knew it. Here we go. Get ready to hide behind your face palm protection. Sometimes when we're watching the uh, ISS footage, you'll see the uh, astronauts sometimes connected to like wires and harnesses. Is that to keep them like in the frame during the broadcast, or what's the reason for that? Oh my days! The secondhand embarrassment is too much for me to take. The front of this guy asking an actual astronaut why they use wires. You know, I haven't actually... You mean while they're inside the shuttle? Yeah, like when they're inside the ISS, sometimes during the feeds, the broadcast, you'll oh, see kind of yes, it, um, pulling on their belts or something like that. I bet that is. I have not personally seen that. Oh, really? But I know that they, you know, they try to be still when they're doing right. like, talking to someone. And then they usually try to release and do like a flip at the end. Yeah. Because like I've seen the yeah. foot before and it almost looked like a foot was caught like inside something, but there was nothing really there. It was really strange. Uh -huh. I didn't know if there was something to kind of like hold them in place or something. Yeah, there's anchor points all over the ISS. That's what he was trying to latch on to. We never had anything like oh, that, okay. but they may have learned over time that it was hard to stay still and they yeah. came up with something. Did you, um, did you ever think the public would find out that all the spacewalks were filmed underwater? Thanks, sir. <laughs> <laughs> did you have any comment on that? Well, we train underwater. Oh, okay. But only training? Only training. Okay. Bless her. She's humoring him a bit. I'll be telling her to do one. Most of the public have no idea that the ISS is located in an underwater neutral buoyancy lab in Houston, Texas. Sorry, let me just correct that statement. Most of the general public don't know that a full-scale mock-up of some of the ISS modules is located in the neutral buoyancy lab in Houston, Texas. The space station footage that they trick us with is not traveling at 17,500 miles per hour above your head. It's all being filmed here on Earth. An exact ISS replica underwater. Coincidence? Well, no. The ISS is 108 meters long. The pool at the neutral buoyancy lab is only 62 meters long. So no, not an exact replica. And why are you calling it a replica? Are you inferring that there is actually an ISS somewhere else? Or You just said that they remove the water and green screen the space in. So if they do that, why are they still getting bubbles? Because they've removed the water. That's because they aren't bubbles. They are ice crystals flying off the ISS. The International Space Station, that's a complete fraud. It's a complete hoax. I don't believe that all these astronauts are living up there and doing all this. Every single time that they do some type of live demonstration, you can see some type of faulty wiring, some type of glitch. They're literally being held up by strings. Green screens, wires, um, CGI, uh, you know, augmented reality, all sorts of issues. Think about this. They always have the women with long flowing hair. 
That would never be allowed. They literally spray hairspray <laughs> in their hair to make it look like their hair is floating in zero gravity. The International Space Station brought to you by the same guys who faked six moon missions. Yeah, I believe that. You know, I don't know exactly how they're uh, videotaping themselves. They could be on one of those zero G planes and, um, you know, doing it all in there. I'm not sure how they're doing it, but I don't believe it at all. It looks like a bunch of green screen. Well, if you took the time to look at the 50 minute ISS tour, you will find that the ISS can't be debunked. It's literally the black swan of space flight. You cannot debunk that video. Level Earth Observer tried and failed. I know I keep banging on about that video, but I feel strongly about it. It's undebunkable. Final challenge video coming for that soon, by the way. Space Station is a serious place. We're doing serious research, scientific research and engineering research. So what? The astronauts are not allowed a little bit of downtime now. Ridiculous. Running around in gorilla suits, going 17,500 miles an hour. There's supposedly micrometeorites, other satellites up there. They could die at any second, but they're running around playing with water. They're always playing with water claiming to grow lettuce. Yeah, they play with water and you mock them for it rather than try and explain what's going on in your worldview. If they weren't up there, how are they doing that with the water? And I love this video because it looks like animation, like something that somebody made, but it's actually real footage from the space shuttle, just sped up just a little bit. And this is a little video, it's about uh, four minutes long here. So there's the space station. I love that this is not animation. This is film taken by a shuttle of the space station. And so this is real, it's not animation. Now this looks like animation, and I'm very proud uh, to, to know that it's actually real film. It's not a video game. People are living there. I know this looks like animation, but it's actually really real. I love this uh, video because it looks like animation. It doesn't look real, but it is real. Okay, so you've taken this lady's speech, which she's probably done many, many times, the same one, and you've linked all the bits together where she says it's not an animation. What does this prove? It's an interesting point because it looks so amazing. And it's just the same speech repeated over. Proper clutching at straws here, guys. People can watch all these trickery by NASA and all these other space agencies, and all that goes out the window because they see a little light in the sky and it's the ISS. Oh yeah, that's the ISS. That's all the proof they need and everything else goes out the window. Do you know how many times people have captured the ISS with camera equipment here on Earth? A lot. The view will still be A-OK -okay out there, and all you need to look for is a bright light in the sky that will be moving, and that'll be the space station. I've seen the light go from horizon to horizon. There's many problems with that light. First, it's as bright as the sun. It's, a, it's really bright. How is the ISS reflecting that light as bright as the sun? It's bright as the sun? Well, surely, Dave, when you saw it, it should have illuminated the entire sky. But seriously, the ISS has solar arrays attached that, when combined, have a total area of around 2,500 square meters. On top of that, the station is wrapped in a highly reflective blanket to keep it cool. It's basically a 17,500 mile per hour giant mirror. Back to me the whole way across. Is it made of mirrors? Is that mirror following me? Right, how would somebody 10 miles away see the same reflection because it can't reflect in all directions? Tell me you don't understand how mirrors work without telling me you don't understand how mirrors work. It's going 17,500 miles an hour for 12 minutes, I could see it. So what is it? I was in communication with a NASA whistleblower and he says that they have five B-2 bombers that they've remodified with, um, some parts of them are transparent material with a thin, you know, thin uh, metal struts that you really can't see. The bottom was overlaid with uh, LEDs to, to match the color of the sun. 
and they use them in their base. Two of them are in Alaska, and I forget where the other ones are, and they take turns doing these flybys. At 17,500 miles an hour, that go around the globe once every 90 minutes. Yeah, sure, Dave. And what whistleblower is this? I think someone's yanking your chain, Dave. Good afternoon, commissioners. Today I'd like to bring to your attention a potential fraud on an enormous scale happening in your county. There's now clear evidence of NASA using numerous methods to grossly mislead the public about astronauts being on the International Space Station. During interior ISS scenes from NASA's own live feed, the use of wires, harnesses, green screens, and virtual reality have been detected to achieve the appearance of a weightless environment. Well, with all due respect, not once have we seen solid evidence for this. It's all just theories and conjecture, and it's all, all, being debunked. This begs the obvious question. If they're really up there, why are they using Hollywood techniques to fake the footage? Are they in space or are they underwater? Now what's really interesting is that they train for spacewalks in an underwater pool with a complete ISS replica. Not complete, just thought I'd throw that in there. Now surely they aren't filming these spacewalks in an underwater pool and then editing them to appear if they're in space. No, they're not. Because that sure would be something, wouldn't it? I'm calling on the Brevard County Commissioners to open a full investigation into NASA's fraudulent practices and use of taxpayer dollars. It costs NASA three billion dollars per year to operate the ISS and if they don't have a darn good explanation as to why they're faking these videos, I and the public would like a darn good explanation as to where our tax money is going. Now, I have sympathy here, a little. If you genuinely think that something dodgy is going on and you pay taxes towards that thing, then you are absolutely in your right to ask questions. However, there is nothing dodgy about the ISS, and it is real. Now, I'm afraid that's a fact, whether or not you believe it. It is our duty to expose and eliminate this fraudulent and astronomically wasteful ISS program. And look, I know what you're all thinking. The NASA is part of the federal government, and you're just county commissioners. Even if what I'm saying is true, what can you do? But let me remind you, not only is this happening in your county, as public officials, you have the platform and the ability to make a statement or hold a press conference, alerting the public, state, and federal authorities to investigate further. You have the power to start the conversation. I look forward to the day that $3 billion annual budget is put towards our veterans, our homeless, maybe some of that mental health stuff the young lady just spoke about, and the revitalization of Brevard County. A very admirable and not entirely stupid idea. Flat Earthers pay attention. We're paying attention to NASA. We're paying attention to SpaceX. Most people are, but yet they'll defend it. They'll defend it. They have no idea the Earth's supposed radius. They don't. Know, they have no idea how far the sun is supposed to be according to NASA. Ninety-three million. They don't know. Like how far is the sun? Like I don't know. A couple million miles. I don't know. They have no idea, but they're defending it to the death. That's because they figured out that stuff before we were even industrial. NASA didn't make those numbers up. They just refined them. You know, once you start paying attention and have an open mind. Pay attention. Let's pay attention then everyone. Yeah, a probe crashed into an asteroid. What's hard to believe about that? The Earth was eclipsed by the moon. Easy. A Mercury spacewalk, I believe, where they had movable helmets. Orion going around the moon, so what? SpaceX put a car in space, totally believable. Epic discover, a million miles away from Earth. 
clearly a sped up section of video. A spacewalk, not unusual. SpaceX landing a rocket, clever sods. A real personal incredulity slideshow, that one, wasn't it? That's the worst footage ever. But we do want to make sure that the Americans, uh, American people understand that uh, there's no need to panic. Uh, the president took this action, as I mentioned earlier, because uh, the objects were indeed flying at low, uh, lower elevation and they were in civilian airspace. And uh, we wanted to make sure that we protected uh, that airspace. But again, I, you know, we want to also make sure that the Amer Americans are not, uh, uh, do not panic during this time. Wait, what? It's on a balloon? Why is there a satellite on a balloon? It's always been that way. Flat Earthers have been talking about this for a long time. Now the official line is that this was a weather balloon. But either way, some balloons are used for things like this. They cannot though put something in orbit. One thing that isn't really discussed in the mainstream is that uh, NASA, you know, of course we know spends more money on helium than anyone else in the world and actually just upped their most recent contract to hundreds of millions of dollars for helium and they admittedly launched balloons bigger than one to two football fields and it's significantly more efficient for transmission of data, for weather compilation of data. They basically have a fleet of balloons above you that are facilitating majority of the information that we utilize. The helium used in balloons by NASA is tiny compared to the amount of helium they use as a rocket fuel coolant. That is why they're the world's largest consumers. So why do you think NASA is the world's largest consumer of helium. Just told you. Why would they send up balloons, these satellites, on balloons if they're in magical floating space, in the magical floating vacuum of space? What, so you can't have satellites and high altitude balloons at the same time? They're showing us, they're telling you right now, they're telling us in plain sight, hey look, satellites are on balloons, they're not in magical space. Right here, at this research center. Okay, the, the loud, loud truck, yeah. Oh, that pesky truck. Uh, I know they're gonna make the, the noise. Okay. Howdy. Uh, oh, those bloody trucks play havoc when you're trying to record, don't they? I'm just doing some filming. What? Not just anything we can see. We're just doing a documentary on uh, the balloon launches and all the cool stuff. Now yeah, we're independent journalists. Don't we? Don't we? Oh, well, I mean, we're a public. There's no expectation no, of privacy. Not, not, you know, well, we, we tried to call them. They said they weren't doing any tours. Okay, that was quite funny, him setting that horn off. They're just orbiting by themselves. Or they're yeah. shot up with the rockets. Yeah, they're shot up with rockets. That's all it, it makes is. more they're sense like, on a balloon, so we're like, okay, well, this yeah, makes I sense now. Unless they got some top secret stuff, I don't know about. <laughs> you don't know about any of these satellites without the balloons? So a guy in a truck says he doesn't know about satellites that don't use balloons, and that means what? You sort of zoomed in on him because you thought it was a win, right? The idea that you would need um, some type of box that free falls in orbit around a ball is really just a fiction of imagination that we don't, we don't need that at all. We don't utilize that. We don't utilize that. There are currently 7,700 satellites orbiting Earth as we speak. You can see them all the time in the night sky. You just need to pay a little bit of attention. Satellites have been on balloons since the 50s and they've always been on balloons. They just lied about putting them in space. There's no evidence at all of satellites in space. No evidence. So I suppose this doesn't count. Or this? Or how about this? But yeah, Eddie, no evidence. They would have to have a propulsion system. Even if you believe that the Earth is a ball, you must also believe that satellites cannot propel themselves without a source to thrust, okay? We know that they don't have engines on them. What's making them go around? 
they don't make sense. Wow, someone doesn't understand physics. Now, due to the lack of air in space, which means no resistance, of course, once a satellite has been propelled to orbital speed by the launch, it no longer needs any fuel. Now, some satellites keep a small amount of fuel on board for minor corrections, but that's about it. Then you find out NASA owns 98% of the helium. Then you find out all these satellites that crash have balloons attached to them. Then you can deduce they actually float these satellites up with balloons. It's that simple. No, you can deduce that a weather balloon has fallen. You can't say that no satellites exist because a weather balloon fell from the sky. If all these satellites are moving 17,500 miles an hour, some are moving this way, some are moving that way, it's common sense. There's 50,000 of them. They're supposed to hit each other eventually, but none of them hit each other. Come on, guys, wake up. There's no satellites. There's no proof of them. The only proof we have are things floating on balloons. Someone doesn't understand how big the Earth is and how small satellites are, do they? Arthur C. Clarke in the 50s wrote a book theorizing about satellites falling around on Earth in an endless fall. Shortly after, we all of a sudden had satellites falling around the Earth. Now think about it. The Earth is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. It's orbiting in an elliptical orbit, speeding up and slowing down at 66,000 miles an hour. It's chasing the sun in another curved orbit, and we somehow have geostationary satellites. That's a satellite that stays above the same plot of land. So it's mimicking the spin, it's mimicking the orbit, it's speeding up and slowing down and staying over that same plot of land, and it's just falling in an ever-ending fall. That makes absolutely no sense. Because it doesn't make any sense to you, then you think it can't be possible. Well, it makes sense to me, Dave. If that's the criteria for its existence, then there you go. But I'll tell you why it makes sense to me. Conservation of momentum. The satellite retains Earth's orbital velocity as it is launched off Earth's surface. Of course, everything on Earth is orbiting the Sun as well as Earth. And you can't even get your definitions right, David. What you described there is a geosynchronous orbit. Now this means it orbits the Earth approximately once per day, which means it appears to stay above a certain section of the ground below. A geostationary orbit is a geosynchronous orbit with no inclination. So that means it lies above the equator. Now it's openly accepted that they're on balloons, but they're making it seem like it's a new thing. And this is the new way we're gonna uh, launch satellites is on balloons and it's cheaper and it's just better. Like we don't need them space ones no more. You know, people are starting to figure it out. That's why they're, they're going back to balloons. Literally no one has ever said that particular sentence or any derivative of it. A majority of all the transmissions we use for our cell phones or quote unquote satellite TV are all ground towers. They all send transmissions from the ground tower to tower, admittedly at high elevations. And of course we have underground and undersea cables that make up 99.9% .9 of all transmission. So this uh, just a facade in people's mind that you have little metal boxes flying around giving you all of your data. None of that is real. I don't think anyone's ever said that traditional mobile phones use satellites to communicate. I'll tell you what does though, this watch. Before I go for a run, I need to wait for a GPS signal. If I'm in a big city or a forest, it takes longer, so I have to wait for a satellite. Once a satellite passes over my certain location, I'm connected and off I go. Oh my God, I'm calling my brother. That is freaking beautiful. Okay, there you have it, Artemis fly- Wow, it's flying right now. Whether it's the ISS or the rocket launch, the second someone sees it with their own eyes, they think it's real. How dare someone say that something they see with their own eyes is real? This is freaking amazing! Oh, there it is. What the heck happened? The reason that you can always find a video of a rocket from NASA taking off and then slowly making a U-shaped arc is not because it's going around the ball and going to the other side or going out into space. It's because shortly after these rockets that are funded by your tax dollars take off, they only have a certain amount of time before they crash back to the Earth because they run out of fuel. Well, they do run out of fuel, but they're usually in orbit by then. And the reason they appear to curve like that is because they want to reach an orbit around the Earth, not fly off into space. Let me show you what I mean. Now I've showed this a few times before on this channel, but it's worth seeing again. This is a rocket launch captured from the ISS. You can see here exactly what I mean. It's all made up. 
So what really happens is they launch them near the ocean in Texas or in Florida. They will never launch a rocket from the middle of the country. And that's really funny because the Soyuz rocket, which has been taking astronauts to the ISS for years, literally launches from the middle of Kazakhstan. It won't make it to the ocean. It'll crash on dry land, okay? So NASA has to launch rockets from Texas and Florida because it's right by the water. If they wanted to launch a rocket from Little Rock, Arkansas, it wouldn't even make it to Texarkana. So when they launch rockets in Cape Canaveral, Florida, or in Houston, Houston, we have a problem. Yeah, the problem is you can't get past the firmament. The problem is, Santos, that NASA don't launch rockets from Houston. In 1962, seven years before they faked the moon landing, Operation Dominic began. A series of 31 missiles were shot straight up into the sky to test how high humans can actually reach. They quickly figured out, not far at all. It seems that whenever they were shooting these missiles up into the sky, they were actually interacting with different layers of this plasma field or this electromagnetic phenomena. And uh, it seems to have fluid-like properties as it actually hits a certain portion of this force field, if you will. It begins to disperse and seek equilibrium based on the impedance of the electromagnetic layers. What a load of words, Salad Witsit. Operation Dominic was a nuclear test program, and most of those were dropped by B-52 bombers. Total nonsense. Why is it when we review this footage that these things are exploding, it looks like they're hitting a barrier? Because they were nuclear weapon tests. Testing the strength of the firmament, and they weren't able to penetrate it. What's, what's going on there? What is this? In my opinion, I think that they were trying to find a way to possibly get out. There's a firmament above us. So everything is as above, so below. Obviously, many people are becoming aware that there's a firmament above. No, no one is becoming aware. Well, flat earthers believe this, but they don't count. That many people are now starting to realize is impenetrable. No matter what you do, you can't go straight up in the air and keep going. An interesting uh, rocket launch was the amateur Go Fast rocket. They gave us something that NASA and SpaceX never gives us, an uninterrupted feed from their camera. If you watch a NASA launch or a SpaceX launch, there's four, five, six cuts before it even clears the launch pad. Gave us an uninterrupted 72 miles, I think, went up and all of a sudden it went kerplunk, it hit something. It went up and it appears to have hit the firmament. Oh dear. I don't know how many times I have to tell you lot. Now this was a yo-yo de-spin device. It's used to stop the rocket from spinning so much. You literally ignore our explanations. One thing I really want your generation to embrace is that the earth is a closed system. We cannot leave the earth. There's no place to go. There is water surrounding us in all directions, including directly above us. We now know that there's something called superfluid that exists. You could have helium-3, and it could actually offer full electromagnetic propagation perpetually without any impedance. Uh, based on the things that I see, such as Crow Triple Seven's lunar wave observations, I think that there is clearly a fluid-like medium above us. Yeah, we debunked that one already. Turns out they were wakes from local airplanes taking off. The waters above in ancient astronomy which was the same science as astrology. Not quite, they were related, but not quite. And besides, modern astronomy is nothing like astrology. Except one was more theological and one was more secular. They taught that this was called the crystalline sea. And in the book of Revelation, it speaks about the crystalline sea. It's the ninth heaven. The waters above, it's firm. I think the evidence is pretty overwhelming that there is a fluid-like medium above us. What I can tell you for sure is the water above is level. Well, why wouldn't it be if the earth is level? Oh yeah, that's right. You don't know what level means. Because all water find and maintains level. I feel that's the next wave of enlightenment is now more and more people realizing as above, so below. And the only way we can get above or below is to go within and 
tune our frequency to that of which surpasses and passes through. Not with all the holes in that top, buddy. Who knows, maybe there is some kind of firmament, some kind of firmament, and there, we're underwater. We could, we could be underwater. Maybe there's water above the firmament and then water down here. That could possibly be why the sky is blue, because behind it is the firmament which holds back water. Oh my days, he actually said that. As above, so below. God's throne does not sit on a convex, silly snow globe, okay? The firmament, the waters above, where he separated the waters below from above, they're flat and level. It's the sky plane. The sky only appears to curve, just like the ground. There is no curvature in the sky. There's no curvature on the earth. It still amazes me how they can actually say that with such confidence. Well, Dave, the SpaceX Falcon 9 is going to launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base, and it's going to launch in just about a minute, maybe a little less here. Just see the trail it's leaving behind. Absolutely amazing, and to describe it to you, from, I and mean, you can see it, but, but from the ground, it almost looks as though... Some of these rockets look like they're scraping across a watery firmament, kind of like a boat dragging something through the water. But I thought you couldn't break through to the water. You've literally just been talking about that. You see what resembles a speedboat going through water. You'll see the rocket hit the firmament, explode like watery, and then it will skim along the surface of the firmament. Why is that? Well, because it's hydrogen. It's water. Hydrogen is not water, Santos. Dear, oh dear. Why is it that Santos always makes an appearance? You'll see the rocket hit the firmament, explode like watery, and then it will skim along the surface of the firmament. Why is that? Well, because it's hydrogen. It's water. I'm not sure what they're doing, but they're not flying into space. It's almost like they're just throwing it in your face. Look, we're running into a solid barrier. These rockets literally look like they're bouncing off the ocean, like a boat in the ocean creating waves. Look at it, look at the footage, look at that. They're putting it in our face. It's soft disclosure. They can't just come out and say, there's a firmament, we're on a flat earth or whatever else. They can't just come out and say it. They have to show breadcrumbs. They gotta show a trail of breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs? How deluded can you be? The rocket plume looks like that because of the rocket boosters. The brilliant Scott Manley thinks it's because of the slick type pintar injectors producing uneven pressure areas. Either way, we know it is not because it hits water. We know this because of the short clip I showed last week of a rocket launch taken from the ISS. So they have to boil the frog slowly. People say, well, what's under the flat earth? Because they're thinking of a disc floating in space. We don't know what's under the flat earth because the deepest hole is 7.8 miles. And while they were digging that hole, while they were drilling that hole, they were using ground penetrating radar to see what they're gonna hit next. And they were wrong every step of the way. No more rocks, no more water. They hit rocks, they hit water, right? They were wrong, wrong, wrong. And then they hit an impenetrable barrier. They tried for years to get through and they couldn't. And then they gave up. But then somehow we have a meme that shows us a cross section of the earth, the next 4,000 miles, they know exactly what's there. They couldn't get the first 7.8 miles right, but they know the next 4,000. And everyone's seen the meme of the earth with the molten magnetic core, another thing that they're laughing at us, because you can't have a molten magnet. Now I'm sure you're gonna tell us all what and embarrass yourself in the process, but let's tackle the first thing you said first. Going down 4,000 miles and knowing what exists at 4,000 miles are two totally different things. When earthquakes happen, they are detected all around the globe by seismic stations, and it turns out we get what we call a seismic shadow. Now this is because one type of seismic wave does not go through the Earth's core. Going down that far has incredible difficulties attached to it, temperature and pressure being the worst. Any magnet of any type, you heat it up and before it melts, it hits the Curie point and it loses all its magnetism. Yep, you've embarrassed yourself. The Curie point is irrelevant when we're talking about Earth's magnetic field because the Curie point is talking about ferromagnetism only. Now the Earth's outer core is a giant geodynamo which produces Earth's magnetic field because of its motion. Two totally different things. Have y'all heard about the recent claim from the heliocentric priests? They're saying that the core has stopped spinning and it's now spinning the opposite direction, which is gonna cause all this chaos. How do they know this? I just wanna know, how do they know what the core is doing if they've only been down eight miles? 
How? How is that possible? We've only, as humans, dug down a maximum depth of eight miles. How do they know what's 3,000 miles down? Makes no sense. Yes, most of physics makes no sense to you, matey. You see, if you actually read the study, you would know how we know this. And you would know that seismologists analyze seismic waves from repeating earthquakes over the last 60 years. What they found was a slowing of the rotation in around 2009, and a reversal after that. If you look at a magnetic field on our ferro cell, you have something called the inertial plane or the block domain wall. That would be where we reside. We live within a magnetic field. And you can only go so far down before you're actually gonna have the reciprocation of that energy or that magnetic field. We know the deepest hole ever dug is around 7.8 miles, which seemingly correlates to the deepest uh, area in the ocean, of course, the Mariana Trench. So the way that I see it is you're actually living on the inertial plane within the magnetic field, which actually then begins to make all celestial phenomena fit perfect within the toroid. And of course, this entire idea that there's this magic magma core made of nickel and iron that's spinning at different speed than the Earth spins is a complete fiction made up of seismic activity and speculation. What a bunch of word salad. Take a breath, Witsit. And actually, the Mariana Trench is about a mile off the deepest we've ever dug. He's still going, by the way. And actually, when you look further into that, they say that that causes the magnetic field with something called convection currents. You have the geomagnetic field from the geodynamo model. And actually, you would have a symmetrical magnetic field coming from the core. As it is a sphere, you would have the same magnetic field in the north and the south. But what the evidence actually shows is that it is not symmetrical at all. And in the south, the magnetic field gets up to 30% weaker. There's something called the South Atlantic Anomaly, which shows that it 100% is not some symmetrical dynamo effect causing the magnetic field. The South Atlantic Anomaly is mainly caused by the intense pressure from the solar winds on our magnetic field. It gets stretched and squashed and actually is responsible for the northern and southern lights. And he goes on. If you actually look further into the dynamo model, there's about 50 questions that have gone unanswered. They can't even get the math to work with supercomputers. It's pure speculation that they can't get to work. And it seems that actually we are just prohibited from going too far down based on pressure mediation within a magnetic field. I can't lie, he is a master at word salad. There was a famous scientist that sent a submarine down and hit the bottom of the ocean and wasn't able to penetrate the bottom of the ocean as if there were some type of water barrier firmament. It's because of the firmament. It's firm. What, underneath the ocean? This one confuses me because we've sent submersibles to the deepest parts of our ocean. What I believe is that this is a plane and everything vibrates and ultimately we have to become masters of vibration to work through uh, the dimensions of this plane. Every This is the third dimensional plane. So that, this physical, 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 this is the physical plane. So many jokes, so little time. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, that was Zeus. Now, if we close our eyes and we envision something, our brain doesn't know the difference between a thought and actual reality. So they teach us about gravity when we're young kids because when you're a young kid, you kind of believe everything that you hear. They tell us that gravity was discovered by a guy named Isaac Newton. And by the time he was 23, he had discovered gravity, invented calculus, and trigonometry. Well, no, not trigonometry, but he did discover slash invent the other two respectively. And there were other scientists thinking about gravity before Newton. They just didn't know what to call it. Well, I'm telling you right now, none of that happened. Gravity's just a theory and an excuse, really. Um, it's real simple. If there's a force strong enough to hold oceans to the planet, there's a force. We should all be stuck to the ground. Um, we are stuck to the ground, Eddie. Don't see any floating humans around much, do you? You know, the force can hold buildings, skyscrapers, tanks, ships to it, but it can't hold a helium balloon. Helium balloon just flies away, smoke just flies. Everything should be stuck to the ground like a magnet. Yes, because a skyscraper is lighter than a helium balloon, isn't it, Eddie? If there's a force, holding oceans to it. It doesn't make any sense. There is that phrase again. Once you look at gravity and you try to prove that it's real, you'll discover there's no proof of it and that there is only proof of density, buoyancy, and electrostatics. None of which can explain any natural phenomena here on Earth. Electrostatics 
is a proven thing. We all know that a positive and a negative will attract towards each other. So the earth has a neutral or negative charge. Everything above it has a positive charge and it is attracted to it. Everything that exists is electric. There's not one thing that exists in the entire world that is not electric. Actually, neutrons have zero electrical charge and objects can be negatively charged. And of course they don't float away which completely destroys that theory for you. It's actually the unifying force that keeps everything here, holds everything together, and everything seeks equilibrium based on that. So everything's trying to find a state of rest based on its electric phenomena or its electric nature within the environment that we exist within. And then when you start to look further into it, you find out that on the smallest scale, electrostatics is significantly stronger than gravity is even claimed to be. Very true, but it's only strong at a very, very close proximity. Magnitude's greater, 10 to the 36 power to be specific. So everything, simply put, everything that exists is electric. Everything that is falling to the ground or not falling to the ground is seeking equilibrium based on electrostatics. We can actually test this. We can use something called a corona motor and whenever we manipulate electrostatics we can make things levitate. We can make things go up or down and we can actually change how fast they go down. We can also manipulate the weight of an object simply by manipulating electrostatics. And of course that's how science actually works is you do an experiment that shows you what the cause of the effect is and you can manipulate electrostatics and cause the effect of downward acceleration commonly referred to as gravity. Of course I've never seen a test that manipulates space-time and you will never see that it doesn't exist. Well done. You've given a balloon an electrostatic charge which overcomes the force of gravity. Now that doesn't mean you can discount gravity because when you turn that machine off the balloon will fall again. Everyone thinks that the reason things fall is because of gravity, but actually everything that exists is electrostatic. So whenever things go to the ground, they're seeking equilibrium. So they go find their balance on the ground where their charge disperses or spreads out in through the ground. So we have positive charge in the air. We have negative charge on the surface of the earth or on the ground, which is why it's called grounding. And then we introduced positive charge and then it went back down to the ground to seek equilibrium. This shows that that's actually what objects do when they fall to the ground. They go to the ground because of the electric force and they seek equilibrium on the earth. If that were true, then every single airplane on earth would fall from the sky. They are overall positively charged. But let me guess, the lift generated from the wings overcomes the force of the charge difference between the earth and the plane. It's fine though, because in your model, anything with a slight negative charge would float away from the earth due to those repelling forces. And we do not see that. We knew about it as in the 1950s, even earlier, and it's all been hidden because if humans were allowed uh, free energy, free movement, and able to explore, we would find out what this place is. We'd find out our position in this world. And that's the number one thing. Why, that's, why are they hiding flat earth? Why, what's the motive? And the motive is to keep us dumbed down, not knowing who we are, not knowing where we are, not knowing the true power that we have. Okay, well what's the motive for that? Because that needs a motive too. I think one of the biggest upsets with globe believers when they hear Flat Earth is, we're taking away their Star Wars, we're taking away their aliens. We know aliens, extraterrestrials, have been documented since all recorded history. I've actually personally seen UFOs multiple times from like the age 18 up, probably seven different times I've seen UFOs. I know it's a very real phenomenon. If by UFOs you mean what it's supposed to mean, unidentified flying objects, then I'm sure you have wits it. If you mean aliens, then no, just no. What about the secret space program? I call it the secret propulsion program. They're using electrostatics and other technology to maneuver around. Maybe they're even just pulling energy out of the air. I thought this was a flat earth documentary, not an alien one. We can go back to, I think it was Reagan and his famous United Nations speech talking about the world coming together, uh, facing a universal threat. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Whilst I appreciate the concept, I don't even think that would bring us all together. They knew back then that that's the, the best way, the most powerful way to get everyone to unite into a one world government. If suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species, from another planet. Uh, 
outside in the universe. We'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries, and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on this earth together. Well, I don't suppose we can wait for some alien race to come down and threaten us, but I think that between us, we can bring about that realization. I see now. The Flat Earthers think the concept of aliens and an invasion uh, would sell the globe to everyone on Earth. Even though Witsit has personally seen seven UFOs in his lifetime. We did secure some footage of the flying disc in the hangar. The code name for the project is Akeep, and it has been designed for humans to fly. We asked the scientist in charge of the project what propulsion system the craft uses, but he would not divulge what he called classified information. As to how much of it is man-made or something that maybe you wouldn't understand, that's a great question, who knows? But I think that they've simply reverse engineered ancient technology and then hid it from the masses so that we don't know what it is. And you can look back at the Germans and they, they explain that we're using electrogravitic propulsion. And so with electrogravitic propulsion, you could attain a perpetual flight. You could defy, quote unquote, defy physics. You could attain all kinds of changes in uh, angular momentum on a dime. Yes, electric propulsion systems are a thing, but they're not commonly used because of the immense amount of power required to run them. I don't think you'll be defying any physics with it, though, either, Witsit. Man-made technology that we don't understand yet. I don't know, maybe there's other humanoids or aliens, whatever you want to call them, like that way and that way, but up there, I don't believe it. UFOs are real. You guys are just confused where they come from. They don't come from some far-off planet trillions of light years away. They come from the outer lands and possibly under the ocean. The authority with which he says this is sickening, isn't it? UFOs are just that, unidentified. I don't think they come from planets trillions of light years away either, matey. But they definitely don't come from outer lands because there are none, nor the ocean because no one's building anything like that down there. I personally believe that the government is so evil that they're devising any type of plan that they can to manipulate people into one world government. They call it the New World Order. One way that they can manipulate people is by destroying cities with missiles and lasers and all sorts of destructive bombs and then they can blame it on aliens. You've been watching too many movies, my friend. They can say that aliens are coming when really it's our own government. Now man has reverse engineered that, so we do have them here now. We know our government has this technology. If they fake an alien invasion, they get the new world order, which they want. They thought COVID lockdowns were bad. We found out that they pretty much lied to us about everything to push an agenda of more total control. We're closer than we've ever been to World War III, all of this other stuff. And now the only way for them to truly, in my mind, get what they want or supersede the timeline, speed up the timeline, is the fake and alien invasion. The moment they do that, everybody panics. The government has to step in as a one world government. All governments come together to fight an outer worldly threat. And then we're all in lockdown like you wouldn't believe because we got to be aware of the alien viruses. I mean, we're already scared of the human viruses. Now we got to be scared of the alien viruses. So that's, I think, the end game. And it's pretty easy to see that that's what they're gearing up for. That's why they're telling us there's a mothership in our... No, like we've had this technology for years. That is one hell of a story. You could take over from Jonathan Frakes on Beyond Belief. Who was the cowboy who confronted Johnny and Larry that night? It was the old woman in on it too. Could Danny have been hallucinating? But if Dan was hallucinating, who ate house food? What about the mysterious behavior of the barbecue lid? Was it really the nanny? Does this story seem possible? Was the morgue attendant in on the deception too? Were there gases trapped within the milk bucket that caused the activity? How was the doctor able to send email without a computer? Was the sewing machine taken over by the spirit of Byron's grandmother? They've taken our focus and put it up there and not to the outer lands or the extra terrestrial area. There are no outer lands, I'm afraid. When someone says extraterrestrial, what does that mean? It means extra terrain. No, it doesn't. It derives from Latin, meaning outside relating to Earth. So outer space, basically. So it's a lot more prevalent that the world is bigger than we know, in my opinion, than these beings are traveling millions of miles or light years away to come here. I believe they won't let us go past Antarctica. So if they won't let us pass, go past Antarctica. My favorite 
my favorite show in the world is Attack on Titan. I believe they're telling us things through shows, that being one of them, that there is potential for other land outside of what we know. Yes, because if you were a government wanting to keep secrets about outer lands, you would definitely give people clues in cartoons. There's more land out there than why are we paying $1,500 a month to live or California. People are paying three to $4,000 a month in rent to live. Why would we have to do that if all of our world could fit into Texas and then there was more land other places? Like, obviously, it makes more sense. Yeah, why would you have to do that? Oh, I don't know, because the Earth is a globe, maybe? You can still have that concept, that idea, that belief, whatever you want to call it. You can still have that on flat Earth. You're not trapped in a snow globe. I honestly do believe that the government is hiding more land. There could be thousands of contents. There's definitely more than seven. I'll bet my life on it. No, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Because you are wrong. Relax, this is only a visual concept, although this is scientifically possible. Running naked through a waterfall and sounding the alphabet with your flatulence is also scientifically possible. Does that mean probable though? And I would argue that it's even borderline scientifically possible. Because gravity means you have to have spherical planets over a certain size or mass. There have advanced aircraft that can do incredible things and move incredible speeds, but it's for here. It's for exploring this world, not scientifically impossible outer space. Little green men running around, abducting people. That's the Hollywood mainstream narrative. There are underground caverns. There are underground cities, deep underground military bases, dumbs. There's all kinds of networks under the ground. Think about all the underground bases. Think about the millions and millions and billions of dollars that go into black budget projects and black i mean there's that is a whole nother industry nasa nobody knows what nasa does what's a patently ridiculous statement to make nobody knows what nasa does the mind boggles regardless if it's uh you know a government hoax to instill fear and control and take away our rights uh, if it's project Bluebeam, uh, just know that these crafts are not coming from upper outer space in the magical vacuum of floating balls they're coming from outer space, not upper space, they're coming from outer space. The extraterrestrials are coming from outer space. So just know they're not coming from up there. There's a firmament. They're showing you on the daily rockets bouncing off of it like water. They're showing you on the daily. They're not coming from up there. They're coming from out there. So flat earthers think that aliens are real, but they come from the outer lands. What a revelation that is. So I've recently come across information from someone inside the military that as early as 1992, they were able to attain uh, the ability to do holography or holograms with acoustic holograms, electromagnetic manipulation, just utilizing light, as you know, um, for very realistic holograms in any size or proportion that you can imagine with the entire spectrum of dimensions. So I would just encourage anyone that does begin to see this activity in the sky to always keep in mind that it could be simple hologram technology used to manipulate you emotionally to get you to be in a state of fear. Of course, we've been warning people about that for over seven, eight years that uh, Blue Beam was, was given to us as a warning via uh, the Secretary of Von Braun that that will be their last card. He would repeat to me over and over, and the last card, the last card, the last card would be the extraterrestrial threat. Oh, the same Dr. Rosen who claims to have met an alien. That one. Hmm. That'll probably be their last, their last card. I think that's where they're heading. They've got the technology. They've got amazing advanced stuff, which they've held from us, the elite families, for millennia. And also, there's patents for this, guys. There's patents, uh, old documents, patents, U.S. government, Russia government, German government, everyone. They have patents, documents from dating back to the early 1900s of building these machines by hand. Why are they building these machines? For what? What, what, what is the whole plan? If, if these are some special things coming from above, then why does man have to build them here to scare you with them? Why does man have to create blue beam technology to, coming soon, scare you with this stuff? Coming soon, amazing. I've recently said in a short that I made that these people are always saying there's something coming soon. Oh, what a beautiful day. So one of the things that amuses me the most about flat earthers is how they're always saying oh it won't be long 
soon the truth will be out and everyone will understand that the earth is flat you all look like an idiot you're on the wrong side they've been saying it for six years probably longer for as long as i've been doing it they've been saying it and i hear it at least once a month whether it be in my comments or on twitter or on facebook one of the flat earthers is saying it it will be soon but you keep saying it and it's not happening and it will never happen there'll never be a point where everyone all of a sudden thinks oh yeah the earth is flat so sorry to disappoint you guys you can keep saying it as much as you want you can keep saying it's going to be soon but no afraid not and that stands for earth being flat uh, fake alien invasions moon landing truth whatever you all think it's coming soon but it's not i'm afraid and it never will well what a wonderful last edition that was for the level with me debunking but that's it we are done i'm afraid that's it for another flat earth friday we're done and dusted that's it for this documentary are we going to get another one who knows let me know what you think in the comments. Are they brave enough to make another documentary because we've totally eviscerated the last three. Thank you so much for watching. It truly is appreciated. If you enjoyed this one uh, today, please do consider subscribing to the channel. We've only got about 5,000 to go now to the big half a million. Uh, and of course, if you really liked it, hit the thumbs up and I'll put a link in the description to the previous five episodes in this little series. And of course, as before with the other two, I'll make a super cut as well and link them all together. I've been Simon Dan Have yourselves a cracking weekend and I'll see you on Tuesday for a Tim Ford Tuesday where we're going to learn all about that twin solar system. See you then.